<laughs> welcome to this hands-on with Rust Studio 1042. And um, I'm going to do part of the demos and the rest will be done by David Millington. Hi, Ron, good to be here. And um, with that, let's start uh, getting into uh, the, the content that we have prepared for this, uh, for this webinar. Um, so um, I'm Marco Cantu, one of the product managers for Rust Studio. I'm going to focus mostly on um, Delphi compiler and uh, DCL controls in this section. But hi everyone, I'm, I'm David and I look after the uh, IDE and C++ and, uh, and so forth. So we'll be talking a bit about uh, Delphi LSP and um, some of the new things in C++ build as well. Okay, so um, we don't want in this session to do like a, um, a review of what is in Temp 2 or what is in Temp 4. I'm going to provide a very quick summary of what has been added to our studio over the last year, uh, but that's really going to be quick, just, just go through the titles, the main areas without getting into any of the details. Um, and then we want to spend the rest of the time going through um, a few specific areas that have been enhanced, uh, specifically in Temp 2 uh, and then spend the rest of the time answering uh, any questions you might have on the product in, in general. Of course, not only on the features we're demoing, but, but on anything that, that you are interested in. Um, so just, just on questions, um, many of you are probably familiar with this if you've been to other webinars, but there's a questions panel in uh, GoToWebinar. So you can just expand that and then you can type in a question there and one of us, whoever is not talking, will see that and answer via text, but we'll also at the end go through and... So let's go through very quickly what is Rust Studio and what is STEM4. Rust Studio is the ultimate idea for building multi-platform applications. Um, and Windows application with uh, high performance um, because they are native application built on the on the CPU. Uh, you can use Delphi and use modern C++. You have powerful visual design tools to simplify and um, uh, and make it much faster to build your application and integrated tool chains with compile native compilers and linkers and everything else that's needed for um, building deploying application to the various um, online stores and so forth. What is great in Rust Studio is that you achieve um, significant developer productivity compared to other um, experiences. Um, you can really build application faster and the applications are fast because they're compiled to the CPU level, uh, regardless of the platform the operating system, whether they're 32 bit, 64 bit and, and so forth. A database access has been a key to the Delphi history and it is uh, extremely powerful. Uh, we have extremely powerful C++ libraries as well. You can use uh, external libraries beside what we provide in, in the product. Uh, for all of the platforms, we have high level, uh, you have low level uh, API access. So you can call Windows API or Java platform APIs on Android or whatever is, or, or POSIX APIs on, on Linux and Mac OS. Um, you have visual designers for fast prototyping uh, and deploying your, pro building your prototype into an application, a strong community with experts and technology partners, and um, a focus on backwards compatibility so you can take your 10, 15, 20 years old code and move it very fast to the latest version of the product and the latest version of the operating system you are targeting. So if that is the, the product in general, what is in what was done in temp targeting? So if that is the, the product in general, what is in what was done in temp four was focusing on multiple areas. One is Windows VCL development. And we introduced a first class high DPI support, including styles. Um, styles were extended in multiple ways in, in, in Temp 4 to let you build modern looking uh, applications. We expanded on developer productivity uh, with implementing code inside with LSP um, and uh, also did a lot of work on the ins installation experience and extended the Delphi language with, uh, with managed records. Um, we improved FireMonkey, we continuously improved FireMonkey, but we specifically added new APIs 
and move to the unified memory management with uh, VCL application and expanded C++ compilers, uh, debuggers and linkers, specifically focusing on, um, on Windows 10. Um, in 10 for one, we focus primarily on quality. So there's not really features. Well, there were features that crept in, but you know, really minor. Uh, in time for two, we went back to extending and expanding what was what were the key ro key themes in time four. So we have um, ex expanded VCL, uh, providing new controls, and I'm going to demo a couple of these. So we'll, we'll see more about this um, later on, and also MSAX packaging uh, support. Uh, we further expanded the LSP to offer even better developer productivity and improve the ID and the user experience uh, significantly. We expanded FireMonkey to support the latest operating systems inside of Windows, uh, Mac OS 11, iOS 14, and Android 11. And we extended compiler performance for Delphi, and the linker for C++, uh, improved C++ exception handling, STL, and um, the um, code inside slash code completion uh, experience. Uh, in both versions, we added, and also in 10 for one, we added, uh, we fixed a very large number of, of, of reported issues um, reported by, on quality portal by customers and uh, really focused a lot on the quality of the ID, the libraries, the compilers, and the entire, entire tool chain. So this is the kind of overview, a summary, and I, again, I've I hopefully been able to keep it to keep it fairly short. Um, now let's start going to uh, in, in some of the areas. So I'm going to, to show two different, completely different things. One is uh, the Delphi compiler performance improvements specifically. And then I'm going to um, have a chat about uh, some of the VCL um, capabilities. So um, let me close the slides. And um, here you can see uh, 10.3 and um, N10.4 uh, in parallel. Uh, that's that's going to be, uh, let's see if the demo works. It's going to be tricky. So um, I'm going to demo two different two different uh, scenarios. Um, one is building Spring 4D, which is a very popular library for um, for Delphi and the other is building a very specific application that exercises the compiler a bit to the extreme but it is reflective of what some of our customers have in their application space um, and in each case we're going to compare the uh, compilation time so I'm going to do a build all in in 10.3 for Spring 4D and I'm going to do a build all here as well not exactly in parallel um, for in in 10.4 um, it's not the ideal scenario because the two are kind of uh, conflicting on, on usage of the CPU and hard drive and so forth, but it gives an idea of the, of the uh, difference in performance. Uh, if not, I'll try to do them in sequence. That would be a more honest, uh, more honest test. Um, so um, this is done compiling. Now we need to view the messages on both of these um, uh, messages. And so it took 33 seconds. And if I go to see view, um, that's, oh, sorry, tool windows messages. Um, this is 28 seconds. It's more or less what I, what I had in, in other tests that I did. Um, it's not a huge difference. Uh, but it is a significant difference anyway. I mean, it's 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 a 10%, 15% improvement of, on, on average. Um, again, these are about the same time that that I get when I tried earlier to um, to build this application. This application is relevant because Spring 4D is um, generics heavy, and generics put uh, a little bit of uh, burden on on the compiler in terms of compilation. Um, however, the area that we specifically focused on, and that is making a big difference, um, depending again on your code, is a completely different, is the area of unit references, and specifically when you have circular references among units. Now, you cannot have a circular unit reference in your interfaces, but you can have in your implementation sections 
of your Delphi units. So what I'm going to do is, um, let me get here. I have this console application that exercises, um, it, it's, it's not a real world application, it's generated code that has like a bunch of, of unit references and honestly, uh, fairly little code. Um, let me do the same here. Welcome page and um, a circular reference. I have a copy there in two different folders, so again, they don't, they don't interfere too much. Um, so this is a large application or representative of a large application. I think it has 3,000 units, something in that, that space. And if we look into it, it's, they're almost all totally useless. Um, okay, if this goes through. Um, so, okay. These are some of the units. I mean, they just have re references to other units. They don't even have real code, most of this. Um, and yeah, I don't know why they're so slow. And they have cross references. So what happens is that if I do a build all here, um, it is going to, to turn along trying to figure out, I mean, you see it goes through the units, trying to figure out the, the, the structure of the units and, and how they are together. And, and the compiler really gets a bit lost. In, in this process in 10.3 and in 10.4 and in 10.4.1, uh, it wasn't really, it wasn't really different. Um, so it looks it's not even compiling, but it's just trying to figure out. Um, the time this is going to take is, is a long amount of time. Um, it, it's really significant. Uh, I, again, I'm doing it live so you, you can see how much time it takes. I can wait starting the other and it will still add up uh, much, much faster. Um, because what it does, well, it has been specifically uh, optimized using some of the fixes that that um, that were in the um, fix pack, the compiler fix pack from Andreas Hausladen, and um, the 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 ultimate effect is a really dramatic difference in this case. It's not just a 15% improvement, and um, it's really um, a completely different story. Now, I'm, again, I'm building them in parallel, so they do interfere a bit um, one with the other. But um, you will see what what it takes if the demo, if the experiment goes well. <laughs> and of course, I tried it earlier, and uh, and it was working when I was alive in the in the session. Um, so what we did, what we've done in time for two, is really trying to go through all of the. Um, all of the fixes in the in in, in the in the fix pack, um, evaluating each of them and then implementing uh, at times in a similar fashion, at times in a completely different way, but focusing on the same unoptimization and resolving it, although with 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 different code, um, to the point that uh, the largest majority, not all of them, there's still a handful that are on the table that we're going to consider for uh, for 10.5. But the largest majority of the fixes are are in the product, and we've had reports from customers that, in most cases, the performance is um, similar. Now, this application took uh, one minute and twenty two seconds to compile, uh, and you can see the other one is still is still lost, uh, and um, it's going to take quite some time. I think the last time I tried was about uh, close to four minutes. Um, so that is that is a very significant difference. Um, again, it, it's a strange application code. It's one that specifically exercises this um, this issue of um, circular references. Uh, but the fact is that this code is common in real world application. The fact that the the dependency among units is not linear, but it is fairly complicated. Uh, happens quite often, and the fact that you can slash the compilation time uh, very significantly is um, uh, that makes a real difference. Uh, now we have to wait for this guy to complete. Um, it's not looking terribly good, I have to say. But uh, um, again, th the last time I tried, it was about one to four minutes difference, um, so not using the two in, in parallel. Um, well, 
it's eventually it's going to go through. <laughs> uh, we might want to continue with the demo and then I'll, I'll get back to this to this window. Um, again, this is one I want to show about, about the compiler. Of course, the compilation speed difference is highly dependent on the code um, and it is more relevant if the application is larger, but it really depends on the code. Uh, it depends on the use of generics, it depends on the use of of uses, it depends on a number of other specific cases that we have that we have optimized. You see now it's really started going through. Um, so at some point it, it's it's going to, to complete. Um, we might even want to wait for it at this point. It's, it's halfway through the real compilation after taking quite some time to figure out um, the, the 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 proper sequence and the dependency graph. Um, so let's see if it goes through, but the uh, difference is going to be quite significant. Okay, it went through in four minutes 39 uh, compared to one minute uh, 22. So th this is this is quite, uh, continue with a completely different area. Uh, and I want to spend um, a little time demoing a couple of things in the, um, in the window space. Um, actually, two things, and they will be fairly quick. Um, hmm, okay, a nice title. This is Project 42, and it showcases the Edge browser. So this is the new Edge uh, component, and uh, all the code I have is um, uh, code to initialize the web view, which might not even be strictly needed, and then navigate to uh, a web page. Um, this navigation is done using the new Edge browser, which is integrated. Uh, I had to install the WebView control on my machine, and then I had to use a GetIt package to download a DLL that is actually deployed in the uh, debug folder for this application. Now the application starts, of course, on the wrong screen. And as I click the open button, I have a modern browser, not, uh, not Internet Explorer. Um, Ooh, uh, which is not displaying anything. Uh, that is cute. Um, okay, I just took a second. Um, so this is this is well, this is just my web page. Sorry, uh, it, it works. It's fully integrated. It, it everything works nicely. Even zooming. I mean, it, it uses Bootstrap, so you can adapt. It, uh, the, the the page can adapt to the to the uh, available uh, browser size um, quite nicely. So uh, that's it, it's really very simple, although there are some dependencies that depend on, that depend on Microsoft, including this DLL that you have to deploy with the, uh, with the application. The last thing I wanted to demo is the, um, new um, control list component. This is a component that's uh, meant to uh, be used when you need to build a fairly large list of um, uh, elements of panels that have the same content. The way it works is that you design one single uh, element and you can change the size and drop in um, any non-visual, uh, sorry, uh, non-window control, so any graphic control, like label, graphical elements, or well, anything else that is, hasn't got a handle. Because the reality is that these components are not displayed where they are at runtime. Uh, what happens is that these components are, are painted to a screen area, and then they are displayed in, in, the, in the drawing surface. So, the system does not replicate these labels and button for each of the visible panels or invisible ones, which are, uh, I think, um, uh, 10,000 in this case, but it's just going to render only what is needed, which is why this is very fast because the only content that's really rendered is the content that is visible uh, on the screen. And that's even cached in, um, in, in memory for your, um, and uh, for your, um, when you're scrolling just just nearby, um, the system is going to use the image in memory, not even going to render the same, the same content again. 
Um, this is th this button. I'm going to show the code in a second. Just displays the controls that, be, that, are, that exist uh, underneath the control list. So there is a panel. Uh, there is one panel, which is this element here, and three sub controls. Uh, of course, on screen you see many more, but they don't exist. They're just a graphic representation of what the control would look look like. Uh, this is where you get a lot of power. Uh, and again, this can really scale to millions of items with very rapid scrolling uh, because of the uh, underlying architecture. It's a completely virtualized um, object. And of course, you don't go modifying the properties of the controls in general terms. You go modifying the properties of the controls uh, one element uh, at a time when this um it, there are multiple options but the most easy one is handle the before draw item event and which is triggered when this when the control is telling you hey i need to display uh, item 23 um feel free to <laughs> to provide the components in, in the right status so they can be painted on screen so in this case, all I'm doing is changing the caption with uh, the number of the items, kind of easy thing. But the concept is that this is where you can customize and you can just draw to the canvas uh, uh, freely. Uh, this is how you customize the, the output for each and every item um, without creating multiple copies of the, same, of the same control. Now it's a little more, a little more complicated, but this is the, the essence. The other thing is that we have a specific button control. This is not a generic T button, but it is a specific control list button, which is aware of the control list. Uh, and as such, when you click on it, um, you can basically interact with the actual instance of the button or copy of the button uh, by knowing that there is one, um, no, sorry, that's not this code. Um, there is one element of the control list which is enabled and you can uh, access its item index. So uh, if the button is clicked for an item that is enabled and there's only one item uh, active in the list by design, and so you can uh, interact with it uh, directly. Um, okay, Th this is what I wanted to show. Um, again, just, just simple uh, demo, but I the idea was to try to clarify the concept behind behind uh, this control, which can really allow you to be to build very nice um, user interfaces. And with that, I'll um, let David continue with his uh, section of the demos. Great. So I'm running 1042 here, um, and uh, I'm using this Windows 7, which is not supported. So. Uh, <laughs> um, keep a bunch of different VMs around for, for various reasons, but uh, officially we, we only support uh, 10.2 in, um, in Windows 10. But um, Michael mentioned that 10.4.1 was really our, our quality release, but um, in 10.4.2 we actually fixed a huge number of bugs as well, and uh, that's also the case with, with Delphi LSP, but we also added some, some new features. So I can demo a few of those here. One of the nice things I think is that uh, in the past we've always had errors showing in the code editor. You know, so you type an error here um, and then you get a, an underline. Um, but now we can show warnings and hints. So if I have say a, an unused variable um, and something else, and I'm gonna generate both uh, Can generate both a warning and a hint here. So uh, this is a warning because I'm, I'm using this variable before initializing it and I have a hint here because I declare it and it's, it's never used. Uh, it's just a really quick way to get a, a warning and hint on screen. Uh, but you can see that there are now underlines for um, warnings and hints as well, just, just the same way that we had for errors. So there's a, a blue underline here and uh, an orange underline for, for the warnings. Um, and this is really useful, I think, because uh, many people have a goal to compile their code without any warnings or hints, which is a, a great goal because um, usually they, they indicate a genuine issue with, with your code. Um, 
and previously you have to go through the, you know, the whole sort of compile cycle to, to get the messages in order to see warnings and hints. Uh, now they just appear as you type um, the same way that, that errors do. Um, now to access this, you actually need to turn this on. Um, so you go to, in the ID options, you go to user interface, then editor, then language. And uh, Delphi is the language that's shown by default, but there are, there are others. You go to error insight and you can change it. Uh, the default is errors only, which is the, the behavior that we've always had before. You can also show warnings and above and hints and above. Um, everything is the same as hints and above at the moment. Um, it's, the LSP server supports different diagnostic levels, but we only uh, currently use errors, warnings and hints. So set it to hints and above. Uh, and then we'll turn on and then you will see your, your warnings and hints in line. Something else we changed is that uh, you can see that next to the warnings and hints, the little icons in the editor gutter, um, that the show for errors as well. Uh, those are useful because when you're scrolling through your code fast, it uh, can be a lot easier to see a little icon on the left-hand side than it is to, to look for an underline. And uh, while we're at it, we changed something so that uh, in the past, we had what we called red squigglies, so a little zigzag. Uh, now there are several different ways of rendering um, the marker for a, a message like an error or a warning or hint. Now I have it turned on to dots on screen right now, which is my, my favorite. Um, classic is, is the way it always looked with, with an underline. You can have a smooth wave, which is uh, more like um, how, how other IDEs render. This takes up a lot more vertical space, but you can see there's a, there's a sort of a thick wave there. Um, or if I go back, you can even just use a you know, solid underline. Um, you know, I, I personally like dots, but uh, the idea here is to, to try and make it uh, a lot more visible. Um, so uh, you know, depending on your, your color schemes or screen resolution or something like that, you should be able to find a setting that, that makes it really easy to spot the warnings or, or hints. Uh, David, a uh, person is asking if you can make the font a little bigger on the screen. Yeah, sure. Hopefully that's, uh, that's more visible now. Um, and if you had trouble seeing before, just looking at this area of code here where um, you can see a, an orange underline and a, uh, a blue underline. Uh, we use blue for hints and uh, amber or orange for, for warnings. So uh, something else that, that I can show you is some, um, we go over to the main form here, have a uh, inherited method. Now, uh, we've been moving a lot of the editor functionality over to Delphi LSP, so then you get all the benefits of being asynchronous and, and faster and, and so forth. Um, so something we might is that uh, you know, when you press down to, to navigate, um, let me scroll here so you can really see that, to navigate to the uh, declaration or to the implementation um, that's implemented in the, the LSB server. Uh, you can do something like uh, just control click the method as well. Let me scroll again so it's more visible when it jumps. Control click the method. Um, and it will take you, uh, you know, to and from the method as, as well. And all that's in the, the LSP server. Um, now for a long time, we've had something where you can control click on any symbol, uh, like stop playing here, and it will take you to, to where that's declared. Um, but that's only been for any particular symbol, like a variable or, or a method name. Um, and many years ago, before I joined a market error, I put in a feature request that I'd really like to be able to do this with uh, the inherited keyword. Uh, because I would like to be able to jump to whatever method it is that inherited is referring to. And to send forward two, you can now do that. You can see if I hold control and move the mouse cursor over it, it turns into a link. And if I click that, it will take me to the method that uh, the inherited keyword actually calls. So this is the first time we've actually had uh, control click for, for a keyword rather than for, um, for actual code itself, uh, symbols and code, I mean. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a rather rather useful feature. Um, a few other things, going back to warnings and hints, uh, it may be small on screen, but you might notice that down in the 
status bar at the bottom of the code editor where you have the, the code tab and the uh, the font uh, size buttons. Uh, you can see something that just reports the number of errors, warnings, and hints that you have. It only appears if there's enough space on screen, but um, you know, if you have enough space on screen, it's a nice, nice thing to see. Um, now, something that came up in the questions uh, was about our generic C support. Uh, so whether um, you know, whether you can use an LSP server for, for other files um, other than Delphi. Uh, so first of all, yes, you can. So um, our C++ support actually uh, uses co-completion through a different open source LSP server called C3. And we made a bunch of improvements in that this release as well. Uh, but we have fairly generic LSP server support. So um, you can define languages here in the IDE options. You go to just the language field um, and you can create a new, new source file type, um, given name, uh, and associate it with various extensions. So Delphi here is associated with you know, PAS and DPR and, and so forth. When you then go back into the editor language settings, uh, you can choose a, a language. Um, so let's choose PHP here. And somewhere in here, it's been a while since I looked at this. Where are we? Hopefully I can find it because I haven't actually looked at this for... Uh... Oh yeah, here we go. So we have a Code Insight tab in the Code Insight Manager. You can create a, a new one. Uh, and that will be associated with, with this particular language. Um, sorry, let me go back to PHP because I accidentally scrolled. Uh, you can see Code Insight Manager is none um, because we, we don't really have any code completion support for PHP in, in Delphi. Uh, but you can create a, a new one here and this allows you to set up um, any third party LSP server. So you give it a name, point it at an executable, um, fill out some, some other information. Some servers have a generic uh, snippet of JSON that you can pass through to, um, you know, to initialize. Um, and then you can try that out for any particular language. Now there's some caveats here that uh, LSP servers communicate in different ways. We only support via standard IO, so console IO. Um, so it's hidden, but we, we talk to servers via, via a hidden console. Um, also that we only test and support with our own LSP servers. So during development, we have tested with others, but we don't support others because you know, they're, they're not our, our languages. Um, but if you want to experiment with pulling in LSP servers for other languages, that's, that's where you do it. Uh, so that was editor language code insight. You, know, you select a language and then you can choose a different code insight manager. So the second thing I was going to talk about, um, uh, let's see, was uh, some C++ items. Let me, oh, I think uh, I was going to choose, show some of the, uh, the nice debug information uh, changes that we, we made. Um, so we changed quite a lot of stuff in, um, in C++ this release, you know, including code completion. We did a lot of stuff with exception handling and, and so forth. But one thing that I think is useful is some um, uh, looking at the linker and debug information. So I have a C++ project here that uses the, the defaults. And if I build that, then um, it'll take a few seconds. Um, it will uh, build in, in debug mode and will then link. Um, and we'll take a few seconds, but you can see if I go over to the uh, you know, output folder here that uh, we have a bunch of .o files, like algorithms.o, for example. That's our, our object file. Um, and you can see algorithms.o here is 1.2 megabytes. Um, now, what's contained in this object file is uh, um, both the, the compiled code uh, and the debug information uh, for the unit, for the algorithms.cpp unit. And all of these object files are then given to the linker um, that will combine them all, uh, read everything and combine into the exe file. And if you have a very large uh, project, uh, this can take a lot of linker memory. So what we've done is address this simply by giving the linker less to link. You know, it has to hold less in memory. Um, sounds deceptively simple when, when we put it like that, but that's, that's really what we do. Um, and so in this object file, uh, we can now split out into two different files, 
um, one that contains the compiled code, which is what you really want to end up in, in your app, um, and one that contains the debug information. So I'll show you how to do that. So you go into your project options and go to building C++ compiler and debugging. And we have this new option here. This is for Windows 64 called Use Split Dwarf. And it's an odd name, but Dwarf is the name of the uh, debug information format that we use. And it's split because it's split out of the object file that I just showed. To expand that setting, you need to set a path where the new debug information files are going to be located. And 10.4.2, this has to be an absolute path. So you can see I've put in a, a path um, here already. Uh, if I save that, and I will clean and rebuild so we can see this all completely from scratch. Again, that will take a, a few seconds while it actually goes. Um, and just wait here while it runs through the precompiled header and then actually get on to um, you know, building some of the, uh, the units itself. Um, now you can see here, I'm waiting for the algorithms file to appear so I can, I can compare that directly. Um, but you can see on the screen that we're getting uh, more files generated. Uh, here it is, it's building algorithms.cpp, so it's generating the algorithms object file. Okay, so here's the algorithms.o file that we had before. And you can see now it's only 300 kilobytes, um, which is a lot smaller than the 1.2 megabytes we had before. And we have an algorithms.dwo, which is dwarf object, which contains the debug information. And that's 600 kilobytes, so it's smaller when it's, it's split out. Um, and when I debug, um, debugging will work exactly as it so always would have a breakpoint here. You can see that I can uh, mouse over. This is a STL object, by the way. So we're looking at inspecting some of the, um, you know, here I am inspecting a smart pointer that's held in um, you know, a, a complex STL object. Um, that's one of the features we added in, in 10.4. Uh, it's quite difficult to do actually to, to inspect STL objects, but um, hopefully you will find this, this very useful. Uh, but the point here is that um, debugging works exactly as it used to but the linker has a lot less to process. Um, and so if you have linker issues where it struggles with memory, then uh, turning on split to off uh, may be, be very useful for you. So Marco, um, I may hand back over to you for the slides and Q&A, please, uh, since I need to sign back into Google to- um, um, Sure. Slides. So this was, this was the last demo that, that we saw. And uh, the other thing we want to mention is that until the end of the month, there is a really special offer. Um, there is a 26% off the professional version of Delphi, Rust Studio, and C++ Builder in light of the 26th anniversary of Delphi last month. But there is an exceptional 36% off on the enterprise and accredited versions of uh, Delphi, Rust Studio, and uh, C++ Builder. So it, it's quite a unique opportunity. If um, you can add it to a macadero.com slash rad offer for more details or contact either your reseller partner or um, sales representative or, well, or the website <laughs> you use to, to, to buy the products from. So uh, again, this is, this is only like one week uh, away uh, until this expires, and it's uh, tied to the end of the fiscal year for the uh, company on March uh, 31st. And with that, uh, we can open it for a uh, question. I need to move the questions on a different screen, though. Um, okay, yeah, we've, we've answered a bunch of questions in the, in the, the of, our, of our text already. Uh, feel free to to add more, and in the meantime, we might want to go through some of the uh, questions that have already been answered um, online. And a uh, quick question is coming because we'll uh, stay here and, and answer them. Um, so I might start from the top, Marco, and um, you know, hand sure. over to you when there's one for you. Um, one of the first questions was uh, was out of about a specific bug, but the general form of the question is, uh, you know, what happens if uh, there's something with code completion that, that isn't working? Uh, the answer there is to file a QP report with LSP logs. We have very extensive logging support for code completion. 
If you go to the doc wiki and the code insight page, um, and right at the bottom of that, there's a, there's a whole section in the documentation on how to turn on logs and, and attach them. So uh, that's, that's basically what to do. Uh, we fix a lot of issues every release. I think I mentioned 10.4.2, we fix a lot. Um, I think we fix somewhere like 95% of the code completion issues that, that we had in 10.4.2. So it's very worthwhile. Uh, qualification there, 95% of the issues that we had that, that had log files, because we, we need the log files to, to reproduce, or not even reproduce, just, just to understand what's, what's going on. Uh, but if you report a, a bug with those, um, very high chance that it will get fixed. Uh, the next question, Mark, I'll let you answer this one about uh, roadmap update and also about um, F2084 errors. Um, yeah, so we don't we don't have um, we're not really planning to discuss the roadmap deeply. Uh, in terms of the Delphi compiler, uh, there is one known issue. Well, it, it it's multiple uh, logs in in Quality Portal, but it's one known issue uh, that slipped in at the at the last minute, which uh, causes um, out of memory errors. Uh, and then after that, like some assorted, assorted memory, uh, the assorted problems. Uh, this is currently being tested. We have um, a, a fix for it, and the plan is to release it as a hot fix. Uh, it does impact LSP as well because ultimately it's the same compiler that's used by LSP and and when you're compiling. Um, so it has some ramifications, um, and uh, with with here with a few customers for testing, testing has been positive, we're just uh, doing some further um, verifications and we should be able to release it as part of a hot fix uh, relatively soon. There are, along with a few other fixes that um, that are important uh, for stability of the ID or of the compiler. Thanks. Another question here about some um... Well, about LSP, and this is actually the one that I answered in the demo about whether it's possible to use other LSP servers. Um, so I, I gave a quick demo there. Just the caveat there is that we only support communication over standard console I.O. I mentioned that a few times, but it's worth emphasizing because other servers sometimes use other communication methods. So please don't expect that any server will work. Um, you need to check the, the tech that, that it uses first. Um, Mark, there's a question here about uh, uh, Linux support, if, if we expect anything else? Um, um, well, it would be interesting to know what, uh, which are the specific requests about expanding Linux support. Uh, Delphi has had it for, for a few years now. Um, we added an agreement with um, FMX Linux, so you can not only build server-side application, but also um, client uh, Linux applications. The limitation or the requirement is that the Linux compiler is currently available only in the enterprise and architect versions of the product, um, and they're not available in the uh, professional uh, version. Just for on that, Marco, there's a follow-up question about ARM Linux and Raspberry Pis. Yeah, these are being considered, and uh, there, are, there are clearly the there is a significant shift in the industry towards ARM overall. Um, the, the most obvious <laughs> push is from Apple that decided to shift their macOS platform to, to ARM, to their own ARM uh, CPUs. Um, although I read yesterday that this is such a deep shift in the industry that Intel is starting producing ARM CPUs and license apparently. Um, so it is a big shift. Now, um, because uh, Apple make, is making this the exclusive option uh, going forward, this is the first platform that we are going to, we are planning to, to address. It is in, in our roadmap. Um, there are two others that are equally important, um, which are the Windows ARM, uh, although Microsoft has been trying to introduce it with limited success uh, so far, but I'm, I'm certain they will continue and, and push it even further. And the other is um, is the Linux ARM platform that has different use case scenarios. One is on the on on uh, maker boards like Raspberry Pi and so forth, uh, which is relevant, but at times a little more hard to justify as a target for uh, I mean enterprise level. 
organization. But it is true that Linux Arm is also expanding on the server and, and server farm. So that is significantly, uh, I mean, that's another very relevant reason to consider it a, as a target platform. These are platforms under consideration. Um, and um, we, we, th there's nothing official that we, we can announce or we want to announce, but uh, we are certainly looking at the market evolution and the industry evolution in that direction. And ARM is uh, a very, I mean, there is a very big push towards ARM on all operating systems. There's another question for you, Marco, about Windows Fluent UE. Uh, what support there might be for that? Oh, sorry, which question? I haven't. Uh, about, about Fluent UE. Oh, okay. No, we uh, we currently don't have native support for that model. We are focusing on well the the RAD approach. Of course, you can skip RAD and just write code. Um, we have seen um, specifically for FireMonkey uh, interesting libraries that propose a different uh, UI paradigm, um, following more or less the 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 the, the, the footprint of Flutter and some of the other. Um, popular UI libraries these days. Uh, we have been discussing <clears throat> if that's um, uh, um, that as, as an optional direction. Well, well, we are discussing it, so uh, I, I will certainly not rule it out. I mean, it's not something we are working on today and immediately, but it's something that is being uh, considered. All right, so there's a question here about fine references. Um, having an issue when there are inline variables in the code. Um, and yes, that, that general side of the IDE around fine references and refactorings and that kind of stuff is on our list to address at some point. I can't give you a solid answer for what release at the moment, but um, a general plan actually is to uh, replace the technology that is being used to implement those features. And that will support some of the, the new language features like, like inline variables. Um, the question of the new VCO controls as well, like to control list that Marco mentioned, uh, that's in 10.4.2, uh, not, not earlier versions of 10.4. So um, yeah, you need the, the latest to, uh, to use everything that we've, we've shown today, actually. Uh, let's see. Oh, again, on C control list, um, Michael just answer this if you don't mind. Uh, it's about whether sure. you know, there's a data aware version of T control list. Um, no, but uh, live findings is, is the way to go there. And then Marco, over to you for this one. It's a bit more complex uh, about using the Edge DLL and the Edge browser. So what's what's required there? What needs to be installed, for example, on a, uh, on a customer machine? So what you need to install on your machine is, um, is two different things. First, you need to install the Edge Control, which is a different installer from the from the Edge browser, uh, it's the same engine, but it doesn't surface. I mean, the the actual Edge application, so you don't you can start it from your start menu and and start browsing. It's only the engine. Uh, that is what the current version, the the shipping version of the of the uh, Web View 2 Control requires. In previous version, you needed the Canary version of the of the actual browser, but that is not a requirement anymore. And of, of course, that makes it easier because you don't you can install that along with your application. This does not install an extra browser on your customer machines if they don't want it, uh, but it only surfaces within within your application. So that's one item that you can get from Microsoft. And again, it's distributable, so you can package it along with your application. The second bit is um, um, a DLL that is actually part of the uh, that is available as part of the SDK. Now the SDK is available via uh, get it. Let me see if I can get to it um, quickly. Ah, um, so it takes a second to get the entire list of things. Um, uh, if I type edge, I should be able to to find it. Okay, so this is the SDK. Um, if you download this SDK, it has a bunch of files in it, and mostly you don't care, including two DLLs, and the DLLs, one for 32-bit and one for 64-bit, 
is what you have to deploy along your your application or executable to be able to load the the edge um, the browser control the edge view to control. Uh, so this is the other requirement. You have to distribute that DLL, which again is freely distributable, uh, along with your application. Now, why Microsoft is not making it as part of the operating system, um, I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> it's kind of a mystery, uh, but uh, providing a different way to distribute that is, is up to Microsoft. It's not really up to us because it's a, it's, it's an add-on to the operating system. Um, Actually, just while you're there on Get It, Marco, would you mind um, going to the C++ libraries section near the bottom of the uh, categories? Sure. Let me remove the filter and then I can go to C++ libraries. So there's a lot of stuff that's new in C++ mm -hmm. and 10.4.2 that we didn't demo. Um, so sure. I just went through the, the linker stuff, but um, we have a lot more libraries available in, um, in Get It, uh, this release, uh, which has really been also something we've been able to do because of a lot of compatibility work that we've we've done. Um, yeah. We also have a lot of co-completion work. Perhaps I should have shown that during a demo. Um, so uh, if you've had issues there, that will be you know, a lot improved. We've had a lot of, uh, in exception handling uh, under the hood. Um, yeah, Marco is scrolling through the, the libraries we have now. There are quite a lot of new ones. Things like the GSL, for example, that's towards the bottom, that's um, you know, the, the C++ uh, standards core core guidelines. Um, which is sort of a, a recommendations for how to use modern C++, and so it's like a small library there that, that really helps you do that. Um, and uh, a bunch of others, we have Google tests there, which is, is useful if you need that. Um, many. Um, so we, we put a bunch up ourselves, but um, you know, hopefully the, the key here is that um, you know, if you want to use third-party libraries yourself, then um, you should find it a lot easier. So, for example, customer cost, we just yesterday mentioning two libraries they were using, asking if we could put it up on Get It and saying, oh, by the way, they just work, you don't have to do anything. So, uh, hopefully, you'll either find that or find it easy. Um, it's a bit of a diversion, but uh, back to questions. Um, some good comments about the Delphi LSP support, which is great to, to hear. Um, some questions about what's coming in 10.5. At the moment, we can't really share anything beyond what's on the public roadmap, I'm afraid. Um, when we get closer to release, we'll be able to, to share a bit more, but um, yeah, sorry, but right now we, we, we really can't, can't answer that. Um, so questions about if the talk is recorded, and yes, it'll be uploaded um, later for, to, to watch replay if, if you missed anything. Um, See, there are a whole bunch of questions that have come in that uh, we haven't had time to reply to by text uh, because they've come in since since we got through the, the demo. Um, so, question here: Does co-completion include the methods from interfaced classes? Uh, yes, yes, it should. Uh, if it doesn't, that's a bug. But to my knowledge, that that works. Um, yeah, I want to take the next question about uh, Edge browser and why we're using uh, Edge uh, Chromium and not providing um, the, the standalone Chromium or integrate with, with Firefox or with other engines. Well, first, not all of these engines are easily consumable. Uh, the, the good thing about TH Browser is that it's a, com, sir, it's a com object, so it's very easy to interface. But the other thing that is very relevant is that by using the platform browser uh, and the actively uh, developed platform browser, um, the, what is relevant is that we are relying on the operating system vendor to provide any security fixes. I mean, and if you're thinking think about browser and embedding a browser in your application, the last thing you want to do is to embed a snapshot of the browser so that every time there is a security uh, alert, you have to, I mean, send a new version of your entire application to your customers to, to deploy a new version of the browser. Um, Edge has an evergreen model that implies that uh, security fixes are sent overnight to, to all computers. And the same happens when you're targeting, let's say, Android or iOS. If there is a security issue with the underlying web view control that PharmaKey uses, uh, you can be certain that the operating system vendor is going to, to jump on it uh, and provide a fix without you having to like update and redistribute 
um, a new application. So that's one of the reasons that staying on the on the platform vendor solution is relevant because it helps address some of these security worries that, that customers have legitimately have. Thanks. I think this next question is on C++. It's common to be nice and better integrate the uh, runtime library and the C++ standard library, for example, to provide stood numeric limits on currency or um, do a hash of a, a Delphi style string. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. And we've actually been thinking about some ways to better integrate this. Um, look, I just said I wasn't going to share anything that's in 10.5, but I can share something that we're looking at closely, don't take as a promise. Um, but uh, one thing that we've been looking at a, a lot of the um, sort of type conversions uh, between types and, and strings, especially because in the classic compiler, you could write code that was incorrect and unsafe, but would sort of just work. Uh, that you can't with the C++ uh, claim compiler. Um, a lot of things like that are on sort of converting to and from types uh, between C++ and, and the Delphi types, uh, like currency. Um, and something else as well is to make it easier to convert between C++ and, and Delphi strings. Right now, people tend to um, you know, call the C method to get a pointer to, to the data and then you know, construct a C++ or Delphi string, you know, passing in that pointer or something like that. You know, we, we would like to uh, have that be, be much smoother and to um, to integrate with string view and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, this is a direction we're very open to and very much wanting to look at. Um, I'd ask actually that you can put that in QP as a feature request and just email me with the QP number, please, and um, we'll add it to add it to the list where we're looking at. Um, Another question, uh, just on where to get the errors and hints settings. Um, that's in the ID options uh, in the editor uh, section, uh, then language, and then you go to you know, the whole bunch of tabs. You go to the Area Insight tab. Um, question as well. Sorry, I'm not getting lots for me at the moment, but I can see lots for you coming up soon. Um, implementing tools like Fix Insight or Visual Assist in Rad Studio, will that happen in the near future? Uh, now, Fix Insight is a great tool, uh, although it's a third-party tool, it's made by TMS, I uh, recommend you, you check it out. Um, but uh, yeah, because it's a third-party, you know, we wouldn't add any special integration ourselves, um, uh, although it's um, you know, certainly something that, that we could look at. Visual Assist, though, is something that IDEA owns, um, and it is on our roadmap for something that we, we plan to integrate. Uh, Marco, a question about the tpath directory functions and how they behave when running in a MSIX sandbox. Uh, that's something I haven't I haven't personally tested, so I'm 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 really not certain. Um, the MSIX sandbox basically prevents you to, from accessing the operating system at large, um, and you can only access to the local. Um, the, the the local files for the application uh, as part of the sandbox. Um, so it is true that the Windows API per se allows you to access and well allows you to see other other areas of the of the file system that are not accessible from legally accessible from the application. Uh, we haven't really focused on providing specific um, filters and, and code for the scenario. Um, we can certainly consider that uh, in the future. It's such an interesting question here, Marco, about FireMonkey controls and the naming of, of properties. Uh, why are they named something like is pressed or is checked rather than pressed or checked? Well, it's <laughs> it that that was a decision that was taken quite some time ago. Um, they they moved to this to, to this coding style, which is common although it's not what the VCI generally generally does um at, at times you are considering changing or refining it but it's it's always it's rare that we go back and and go updating some of the some libraries that have been around for years because that ends up ends up um uh, causing trouble with for for existing code although we double we double everything with with two versions but then it, it makes 
it makes it very confusing for new users. Hey, you have two ways to do the same same thing. So, it's Christian Marco. That's actually for C plus plus builder. It's about MSIX, um, which you can probably answer better than I can. Is it possible to uh, deploy ad hoc with a self signed certificate with MSIX? Um, yes, I, I, you should be able to. So MSAS can be used in, in different scenarios. It's generally a packaging architecture. Uh, one option is certainly to use it for store deployment, uh, in which case the certificate for the signing is provided by Microsoft. The other option is to do your own code signing with a signing certificate. And, um, and generate an MSX package that you can distribute to, to other people in your organization or other organizations that trust your, your, your certificate. Um, I, if for, for more information, I might need to, to ping someone at Microsoft that knows more than I do. So if you want to follow up over email, that, that's probably the best, the best option in this case. Thanks. There's a comment here as well about um, Delphi 10.4.2, very satisfied with LSP and the almost automatic migration of projects from the previous version, much faster and more stable than 10.3. Well, that's great to read. It's uh, exactly our goal, so I'm glad to, glad to hear it. Um, let's see, there's a question about exception handling and a particular bug. I will need to look that up, I'm afraid. Um, we fixed a lot in this release. Uh, there are a few more things that we may fix in 10.5 as well. Um, so I'll need to look up that, that specific bug to answer. Uh, Marco, a question here about some um, Kanopka signature controls uh, supporting high DPI. So yeah, we have already released, uh, actually at, at, at the time of, of 10.4.2, an update to Kanopka signature controls with uh, styling support because they were a bit behind in terms of integration with BCS styles and some of the features that were added for um, uh, in, in recent releases. Um, now we have also worked on having full high DPI support, including having images at multiple resolutions and, and higher resolutions and so forth, uh, making sure that everything works smoothly um, in, in, a, in a 4K monitor, in a high definition monitor. Uh, now, this hasn't been released yet. It's currently being, while well, there is some configuration and change to the installer that is being done and some additional testing, we expect to have it available uh, shortly. Um, so just 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 wait a bit more and, and that uh, additional version will be uh, made available. I, I, I have a caveat there that this will only work with uh, 10.4 because we are leveraging new VCL features that were made available in 10.3 in, in, in and 10.4. So while older versions of, of Konopka controls, including the last we just released, also work for older, um, like work for 10.2 and 10.3, the new version that's coming out will be 10.4 uh, specific because that way we can use uh, core features that, that are part of the VCL library rather than replicating that type of code. Um, Marco, there's another question as well. Um, everything that you explained earlier about the Edge browser uh, a few minutes ago, is, is there documentation on that or a blog post or something? There similar? is a blog post that Jim McKean did. I can, if you answer the next question, I can, I can find the link and put it and put sure. it in the chat. Um, I'll do that. Well, yeah, the next a question. blog post that Jim, that Jim did a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. The next question is, um, asking if anyone has run into a problem with code completion not working when you press period or, or dot. Um, now, Bruce, interestingly, I was just looking at a bug report about this earlier today. Uh, seems difficult to reproduce. I can't reproduce it myself, for example, and I was asking one of our QA people to look into it more closely. Um, so it seems that there are a few people out there where the, the sort of auto invoke, um, where you press dot and you, know, you wait a short period and it should just show up by itself, may not be working. Um, if you can reproduce this, that would be very helpful for us because we are having trouble doing so. Um, what I'd ask, please, is if you can um, 
attach LSP logs. Um, so following the, the info on the on the doc wiki about, about log files. Um, and we'll pass that on to the LSP and ID engineers and, and, and see what's going on. Um, oh, so I see Marco just um, so I'm going to go back to uh, the question about TH browser and, and blogs. Uh, Marco just um, posted a, um, a, a link in the in the chat. Yeah, and also there is another uh, there is a in, in, there is another question that uh, or suggestion that Matthias had. Um, it's a GitHub uh, entry from Microsoft that explains uh, some of the configuration scenarios and, and reasons for for the current uh, architecture, um, and um, yeah, explaining the, the dependency between uh, Edge and uh, and the WebView 2 component in the inter-release version. So that's also useful useful information. There's a question here about Boost for Android and iOS, Boost being a very key C++ library. Um, so we make a modern version of Boost available for Windows. Um, the Boost support that we had for mobile um, has always been third party. Um, and so we, we don't officially support it. I, if you can drop me an email about that, please, I can, uh, I can look into that. Um, suggestion about LSP where um, you know, as, as you type to, to filter code completion, um, you know, currently it, uh, it matches based on the on the string that you've shown, but maybe it should be a bit more flexible so that um, you, know, you can type uh, letters that belong to several parts of a, a word. Like in show message, you could type sh and m. Um, look, we've, we've thought about things like that, that kind of fuzzy matching a bit. We don't have any specific plans to implement that at the moment, but it is something that we're, we're open to. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely an interesting suggestion. And the next question also on C++ is about the, the format um, in curly braces, FM, pardon me, FMT in, in curly braces. Um, look, we guess that, that's coming to get it, actually. Um, so uh, that should arrive within a few weeks. Um, it's a fantastic library. And yeah, we, we definitely want to make that available on, on get it. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's this. I'm jumping to a to a later question because I'm actually sh showing that on screen. The person is asking the, what which are the uh, special add-on and packages on Get It. Uh, th this is the list. So these are items that are available if you are on active update subscription. Um, and there is there's the bonus con controls. There is a long list of of styles. There is a Twine compile if you're into C++. Uh, there is there are three utility ID add-ins: uh, Navigator, Parnaso, Parallel Debugger, and somewhere um, I lost it. Uh, well, there should be another a third one. I don't know why it doesn't show up. Uh, there is FMX Linux, uh, which is part of the update subscription um, bonus pack, um, and we keep uh, uh, we keep adding features. Uh, are available exclusively to customers that have an active uh, an activity subscription. Now, there's a question here about code completing uh, and pardon me, code completing an inherited method in the interface section. Um, yeah, that's that's a good suggestion. Of, that should already work actually. So um, if you're declaring a class and you invoke code completion there, it should show a list of ancestor virtual methods. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that should already work. It's a, it's a neat, neat feature. It's a question about C20 and the modules feature. Um, whether we would, I mean, currently Delphi uh, creates headers, HPP files, um, whether we'd use those as modules instead. Certainly something we'd look at, but our plans for C20 would be to support it uh, as is straight away. And then sort of as a step two, looking into uh, things like, like modules. Um, so let's see. Uh, Mark, there's a question about TH Browser. Um, 
uh, can you interact with the content in the edge browser? It actually says in the TEDGE browser uh, response. I'm not quite sure what that, that means, sorry. Um, uh, honestly, I don't have like a deep expertise, but uh, if you if you read the, um, uh, the blog post that, um, um, that Jim McKeith did that I linked uh, earlier, it shows, for example, how to get the, the source code of the of the byte page, how to run JavaScript, which implies interacting with the with the web browser and the web content, and um, and um, also displaying not a page but displaying HTML in the browser content. So the 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 blog post from from Jim McKeith um, from from ten days ago has actually um, a lot of nice small snippet that shows how to interact not only how to configure it but also how to interact with the with the component and ultimately because it uses platform apis uh, there is a lot of documentation on the microsoft and on how uh, all of these things uh, work there's a question here about the parallel debugger add-on which is actually one of the ones that marco just showed in get it um, which is a nice add-on when using multi-threading so that's that's great i'm glad you like it there's a question about um, some issues there. Um, that's the kind of thing we'll, we'll fix in upcoming release. Um, the debugger add-on there actually um, really stresses the inbuilt debugger a lot. Um, for example, it will show call stacks for you know 20 different uh, threads, and so that's 20 times as much sort of interaction as, as the IDE does. What this means is that if, if there are bugs in the IDE and, and the debugger itself, um, that plugin is sort of more likely to, to bring them to light, uh, which is unfortunate because it makes the plugin um, you know, look look bad. Uh, but at least it, it helps us find those issues and, and resolve them. So uh, issues like that will be fixed as, as normal bugs release to release. Um, Marco, there are probably a couple here about this one about data snap rest server and uh, the rest debugger. Yeah, I saw it um, in. The, the REST debugger was meant at, uh, as a general purpose uh, techniques to access third party uh, REST um, services. But then it was slightly extended to support um, RAT server. Uh, we haven't really been considering supporting DataSnap, but it is, it is a, reasonably, a reasonable idea. So we can, we can certainly uh, add, uh, add um, uh, that, that angle to the tool. Uh, but uh, having a, a, a feature request in, in uh, quality portal would actually be uh, nice to, to avoid forgetting the request. And actually on that note, there are one or two questions here about sort of general issues and um, you please enter QP reports for those because it's only th you know, through a bug report that we can actually address bugs. And, and feel free to email us uh, asking oh, yeah. for, for providing extra information or asking for specific. I mean, we can always, I mean, keep an eye to, 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 to bug reports and provide internal information that might, might not be visible on the, on the system. Uh, Mark, there's a question here for you about getting um, stack trace at runtime on Mac OS. Um, I mean, you can do that on Windows through third parties like Eureka Log, but what about Mac? Yeah, we don't we don't natively support uh, stack traces on um, on any platform. Uh, we we do indirectly through through third party tools, whether they are they are paid or open or other options. Um, that that's a request that's been lingering around, and we understand it's relevant. Um, it, there's nothing I really ca can really announce. Um, uh, it's tricky because it requires um, distributing enough debug information to make that log useful, but small enough debug information to avoid like inflating executables and revealing things you might not want to reveal about about your your application code. So it, it is difficult because there are kind of conflicting conflicting um, requirements to keep. Uh, uh, to, to consider at the, at the very same time. And the fact that different platforms do things fairly differently, so that adds a bit of, of complexity. But it is something that has been asked and has been under consideration. 
There's a question here again, Marco, about the um, get it packages list for um, update subscription customers in 10.4.2 and, and where to find it. Maybe you could just show that on screen again. Oh, sure. Uh, is it this one? But when you open get it, there's a... Yeah, uh, there, is a, there is a subscription yeah. only. So there is a filter all installed, which is what I have currently on, on, on this machine. Um, oh, I thought I had more. Wow. And subscription only. Uh, which is the subscription items and then updates, which is anything that you have installed and for which there is an updated version that you might want to consider to consider um, installing. So subscription only, and then of course you can pick a category and they work, uh, they work as and, uh, so there will be only, um, I don't know, ID plugins that are subscription only, for example. Thanks. There's a question here about um, you know, uh, pricing for, for non-profit companies. Um, look, in PM we, we, we don't really control you know, sales pricing and that sort of thing, but um, I think if there are cases like that, um, you, know, you can certainly email us and we can you know, pass it on. Um, you know, the sales department may, may take it into, into consideration. Um, Question about where are the LSP logs? Um, uh, so they're, they're written to a, to a particular folder. Um, there's this full documentation on this uh, that I'm 99, yeah, I'm 100% certain, 99% certain uh, includes where, where the files are located. Um, if you go to the Code Insight page on the Docker key, then right at the very bottom, there's a section on, on generating the log files here, how to turn them on and how to find them and, and so forth. Um, just a note there that uh, you know they're often very verbose. So um, if you leave them running for a long time, they can take up a, a lot of disk space. So really, it's best uh, to just turn them on, reproduce something, and then, then turn them off again. But the good news is that they're highly compressible. So I think uh, a while back I had a 700 megabyte log file that I compressed down to 20 kilobytes or something like that. It was it was extraordinary. Um, now that was using 7-zip, which is very good. Um, but uh, certainly, even if you have a large log file, um, you, know, you, you can compress it before sending on to us. I think we're at the bottom of the question list. Marco, do you see any others that uh, we missed? No, I don't, I, I don't think, I mean, th there are others, but I don't think there's anything else that is, that is critical or, or, or general purpose. Um, and given that we are kind of already like 20 minutes after, after the top of the hour, uh, I think that that um, that that's quite nice to to, to end here. Um, I, I really want to um, to to iterate again. I mean that time for two has been has been a very nice release, very well received uh, for some of the features that we have displayed in this um, in this hands-on webinar, but also others that we didn't have time to 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 go through. Uh, it's really a very nice version of. Um, uh, Delphi. Someone mentioned that is like, the new classic after Delphi 7, which um, is certainly positive. Hopefully, it doesn't remain the version that people use for the next 20 years without updating anymore. But, uh, honestly, uh, that that that's kind of a risk worth worth running if you really put, can put out something that is very stable and very nice for for customers. Um, uh, anything else to add, David? Yeah, uh, Brian just noted about LSP logs again. Um, the logs can contain source code, uh, which is true. It will contain um, information about, uh, you know, as it, this, this passed from the ID to the server, and that, that includes source, um, especially if you modify a, a file. If it's just a file on disk that isn't modified, it'll server will read it directly. But if you modify something in the ID, the ID sends that those modifications, which is actually the whole contents of the unit, uh, over to the server, and that's included in the logs. Uh, that's noted in the documentation, but it is important to point out. So if you have anything there that you don't want to put on public QP, you can always email it through to us, uh, and we'll include it on our internal private copy. Uh, so thanks, Brian, for, for pointing that out. Um, but other than that, um, no, I don't really have anything to, to add. Uh, it's been fantastic seeing all the questions come in. Uh, what we've demoed today is only a small amount of what's in 10.4.2. Um, uh, we're posting a lot of blogs about it as well. I posted four in the past week. Um, and Marco, I know, has posted a bunch as well. 
So uh, check 1042 out and we, we hope you like it. And uh, thanks for, for attending the webinar. Yeah, thanks a lot for for joining and hope to see you soon, uh, possibly even, even in person in the future. That would be nice. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye.